Welcome to Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. Our team's goal is to present science-based information about gardening and all things nature in New York's Hudson Valley. Host Gene and Tim, along with team members Teresa and Linda, are master gardener volunteers for New York's Columbia and Greene counties. So if you're interested in gardening or nature or nuggets of information about what's happening outside your door, settle in. Enjoy the conversation. Whatever the season, we have something to say. Hi, welcome to Nature Calls, conversations from the Hudson Valley. I'm Jean Thomas. And I'm Teresa Golden. And this time around, Annie takes on a summer legend. Patch to Plate addresses the challenge of fabulous summer squash with some awesome recipes. Then we hear from Ulster County's master gardener, Barbara Bravo. Her new segment of Made for the Shade expands our skills discussing the use of contrast and texture in our shade plant selections. And we close with another Hits and Myths piece from Devin Russ, talking about the great debate that goes on concerning watering in full sun. This is totally a summer episode, isn't it? My name's Annie Skabinski, and I'm a Master Gardener volunteer. And while usually behind the scenes of Nature Calls, I'm a regular podcast team member and happy to host the Patch to Plate series. On today's episode, we're talking about summer squash. In episode 11 of Nature Calls, we interview Brianna Davis from Green Bee Greenhouse Limited, located in Cornwallville, New York. She talks about timing for planting your warm weather plants like zucchini. Listen in when you have a chance. Be sure, too, to check out the Summer Squash Growing Guide. I've put a link in the show notes. The thing about Summer Squash is that it's good raw. It cooks quickly in a variety of ways and only needs a little heat and some simple seasoning to show it off at its best. Generally, Summer Squash pairs well with cheese, garlic, olive oil, onions, parsley, salt, pepper, tomatoes, and vinegar. Things that you have on hand, stable pantry items, and things that are growing this time of the year. You may have heard that you can eat zucchini blossoms, and that is the case. Typically, you'd harvest some of the male blossoms on the day they bloom. Certainly, you don't want to harvest all of them. You want them in the garden doing their job, being available to pollinators, mostly bees, that'll transfer the pollen from the flowers to the female blossoms and fertilize them to produce actual zucchini. As a side note, my father-in-law was known to pinch off zucchini blossoms indiscriminately just to reduce the abundant harvest. There's a squash blossom recipe in our Master Gardener cookbook. The book also has recipes for zucchini bread, chocolate zucchini bread, zucchini pancakes, and even a blueberry zucchini muffin. You can call the office if you'd like to buy a copy. A less labor-intensive use of the squash blossoms would be to make a frittata. Use your favorite basic frittata recipe, combining eggs, Parmesan cheese, salt, and pepper. The recipe that I've adapted comes from Jack Bishop in his wonderful book, A Year in a Vegetarian Kitchen. It may be available through your library. It's available through mine. I'm in the Mid-Hudson Library system. Anyway, the approach is to rinse off the squash blossoms, shaking off excess water and any insects, trim the stem and the tough bottom portion of each blossom, and cut each in half from top to stem. Move the oven rack up to the top or second from the top position so your fry pan will ultimately fit into the oven separately. Preheat your broiler. If you're a frittata flipper, you can skip heating the broiler. Heat an oven-proof skillet to medium or medium-low. Season your pan with cooking oil. Olive oil or olive oil spray would be good. Place your egg mixture in a hot pan. Cook for two or three minutes until the frittata begins to set. Arrange the opened squash blossoms on top like a flower with the top of the open blossoms toward the edge of the pan. Fan them out so that they're overlapping and then the whole pan looks like one big flower blossom. When the bottom is browned, you can flip the frittata. 
or if you're not a frittata flipper, you can place it under the broiler until the top is golden brown. This will just take a minute or two. When the top's brown, pull it from the oven, place it on a cooling rack, and let it cook for a good five minutes so that the masterpiece will release from the pan. You can cut this into wedges and serve it warm or at room temperature. Let me give you a couple variations to think about. Shred about a pound of zucchini using the large holes of your back grater. Wring the shreds in clean cotton towels to remove most of the oyster. Add this to the egg mixture with a bit more salt before it goes in the pan. Another variation would be to add a quarter cup of dairy. You could use milk or cream or cottage cheese to the egg mixture. Whisk it together. Pour it into a quiche pan with or without shredded zucchini and bake it. You'd have a nice quiche. I like to harvest most of my zucchini and summer squash quite small and tender. I slice each into quarter inch rounds directly into my breakfast skillet. I cook them until just golden brown, flipping them after a minute or two. What do I do next, you ask? Well, for breakfast, I break a few eggs. I have friends in the neighborhood who share their fresh eggs with us, and I share freshly baked bread with them. So I may pull the zucchini out of the pan and fry a couple of eggs over easy, serving them with zucchini as my side, or I may scramble the eggs and pour them over my zucchini, either creating a zucchini scramble or an omelet, depending on the universal forces that govern pan flipping. If I go the omelet route, I probably fold in a few tablespoons of mozzarella or ricotta before folding the omelet. It's a great way to start the day. Once I told B.R. Shute, the farmer owner of uh, Hardy Roots Farm, how I made my breakfast zucchini. He told me that he'd much prefer I use butter rather than olive oil, asserting that the zucchini from his farm deserved butter. I leave it to you. Yellow squash can be prepared in the same ways. Using a combination of yellow squash and green zucchini adds a nice color and textural interest to the dishes that you make. Almost every week, I make a big pot of brown rice. I use veggie stock and frequently add a minced preserved lemon to the pot before the cooking starts. Then I have a great big pot of rice on hand for whatever the week brings. For summer lunches and dinners, I'm bringing in veggies from the garden and creating quick stir fries. I've also included a link to a zucchini stir fry in the show notes. That recipe serves eight, so adjust for the number of diners around your table. Here's a quick overview, though. You chop zucchini and summer squash into bite-sized pieces. You do the same with your onion, red or yellow. Add bright bell peppers. I like red and orange and yellow. Heat a tablespoon of oil in a frying pan or your wok. Add the veggies to the hot pan and cook quickly, stirring frequently for five or six minutes until the veggies are tender. Add the rice, allowing it to just warm in the last minute or two. Or you could serve the rice separately. I steam mine to reheat it, and then top it with the hot stir-fry. Remember that these tender summer squash need little to shine, so dress gently with a little olive oil and maybe a little grated parmesan. Hit it with your hot sauce or chili crisp if it's begging for some spice. For some stir-fry variations, try adding seasoned shrimp, cooked chicken, or tofu into the veggies during the last three minutes or so. Or... Scramble a couple of eggs into the pan with the veggies, creating a soft scramble. During the last minute or so, cover the pan with a tortilla, just warming it up. Plate the tortilla, fill it with the scramble mix, and create a wrap. On to patty pan squash. It's another variety worth cooking up. It's denser than the others we've talked about. My takeaway is that this is the summer squash that I want to roast. For the two of us, I use a half a pound of patty pan cut into one inch chunks, a medium shallot sliced thinly, a teaspoon or so of chopped fresh thyme, a little olive oil, maybe a tablespoon, and a pinch of kosher salt. Gather up the ingredients, preheat the oven to 400. When I chop up the patty pans, I usually scrape out the seeds. I put them with the wet garbage because I don't want them in my compost and volunteering new plants in unwanted places next year. To put it together, toss the squash, shallot, thyme, olive oil, and salt in a small bowl. Spread it out onto a sheet pan and bake for 15 to 25 minutes until the squash is tender. Monitor it periodically by testing it with a fork. 
serve hot or at room temperature. As an end note, we often dehydrate zucchini when the harvest is abundant and the neighbors lock their cars to prevent us from sneaking some in. We use it all year long in soups and stocks and stews. I've included a link from the Utah Extension Service that covers all means of preserving zucchini. For other recipes, please go to the nutrition page on our Cornell website and enjoy. That's it for this edition of From Patch to Plate. I'm Annie Skabinski. You're listening to Nature Calls, conversations from the Hudson Valley. Stay tuned for Made in the Shade. Hi, and welcome to Made for the Shade, a recurring feature of Nature Calls that delves into the challenges and rewards of shade gardening. I'm Barbara Bravo, a Master Gardener volunteer with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Ulster County. Since plants growing in shade often have fewer flowers, adding texture and contrast is one of the ways we can make these gardens visually more interesting. For example, two complementary forms in my garden are Ligularia Brit Marie Crawford combined with Hakona Chloa Macra, all gold. The large, dark chocolate green leaves with beetroot tones on the underleaf of Brit Marie Crawford, also known as leopard plant, are bold and in late summer send up tall yellow daisy-like flowers that butterflies flock to. Interestingly, shade-loving plants often have large, wide leaves that act as collectors, soaking up as much sun as possible. Ligularia does best in all-day dapple shade or morning and late afternoon sun with shade during the afternoon. Depending on conditions, this plant can grow three feet high and two to three feet wide. When Ligularia is paired with the cascading softness of Japanese forest grass all gold with its bright limed golden yellow leaves, The combination makes an eye-catching spot in the garden that adds light to shady beds and borders. This cultivar of Hakona grass is more compact than some of the others in its family. It is a slow grower, growing to about one and a half feet tall and slightly wider, flowering in July to August. The blooms are delicate but not showy. This plant is all about the foliage. Both of these plants... Brit Marie Crawford and Algol tolerate shade well, and both do best in moisture-retentive soil. They also get bonus points for their low maintenance and because they are deer-resistant. When we think shade, often the first plants that come to mind are ferns. Ferns convey a soft texture and have a range of color, from all green to gray-green with silver highlights. Some of my favorites are Japanese painted fern and the red coppery colors displayed by Dryopteris autumn brilliance, as well as our native maidenhair fern. They contribute their unique traits while being low maintenance and also pest resistant. Japanese painted fern, botanically known as Atherium neponicum pictum, is prized for its silver blue foliage. It's easy to grow, preferring partial shade and moist, rich soil. And the addition of compost will aid in keeping the soil moist. Of course, during periods of drought, these plants will require water. If that's not possible, the plants may go dormant. However, they often grow new foliage in the same season once the rains return. A favorite combination of mine is planting fall-blooming crocuses, also known as naked ladies, in a clump nearby. The lovely, leafless, six-inch-tall pink blooms look beautiful with the silver-blue foliage of Japanese painted fern. To add more contrast using leaf shape and color, add the low-growing Asarum Europa, European wild ginger, as an edging. This low-growing 
up to three inches or so ground cover features glossy, heart-shaped, dark green leaves that spread to about one foot wide. Grow this trio in moist, well-draining soil and part shade. If all blooming crocuses are new to you, these bulbs will send up all green, lance-shaped foliage up to 10 inches tall in spring, as other spring blooming bulbs do, supplying nutrients to the bulbs before the foliage withers and dies. In late September, the flowers will emerge without foliage. That's where they get their name, Naked Ladies. Until next time, I'm Barbara Bravo. You're listening to Nature Calls, conversations from the Hudson Valley. Stay tuned for Hits and Myths. Hello, this is Devin Russ. I'm a Master Gardener volunteer with the Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Greene Counties. And I'm here with an episode of Hits and Myths. Today I'm going to talk about, can leaf scorch be caused by watering on a sunny day? Have you ever heard that if you water your plants on a sunny day, the drops of water on the leaves will act like little magnifying glasses and focus the sunlight in a way that can burn the leaves? I have heard this, and I often wonder, why don't we see lots and lots of scorched leaves? In our area, it's pretty common for the sun to come out and shine on leaves that are still wet from rain earlier in the day. If that kind of natural occurrence doesn't harm the leaves, why would the leaves be harmed if the water comes from a garden hose? So, I did some research to see if any plant scientists have investigated this. It turns out that many plant scientists are very interested in leaves that have dead brown patches that look like burn marks, especially along the edges of the leaves. They call that pattern of damage leaf scorch. But the interesting thing is, this leaf scorch is not caused by water droplets focusing sunlight. It's not even caused by any kind of burning. The most common cause of leaf scorch is drought. If a plant can't get enough water to maintain all of its leaves, parts of the leaves start to dry out and die. The damage shows most at the edges of the leaves, because edges are at the very end of the line in the plant's water delivery system. This damage can be prevented by deep watering, even during the day. The second most common cause of leaf scorch is root damage. If a plant has lost some of its roots to pests or earth-moving equipment, the remaining root system may not be big enough to support all of the leaves, so some leaves start to dry out and die. Again, this type of leaf scorch can be avoided by protecting the plant and by deep watering. A third cause of leaf scorch is salts or acids that chemically burn the leaves. This is commonly seen in lawns with yellow spots left by acidic dog pee, or roadside evergreens that have yellow needles only on the branches that are in the spray zone and got coated with road salt. Chemical fertilizer can have the same effect, so it is important to follow directions when applying concentrated fertilizer. The pattern of damage called leaf scorch can also result from some plant diseases. But leaf scorch is not caused by watering. I also found one group of scientists who examined the optics of water droplets and how they may focus sunlight. Although they found that water droplets can focus light, the focus spot of a water droplet is tiny. So the tiny amount of heat caused by concentrating the sunlight at that spot is largely spent heating the water droplet not the leaf. And two, the drop of water also cools the leaf as it evaporates, so that offsets the tiny heat gain from focusing the sunlight. These scientists also noted that a water droplet sitting right on a leaf is not in position to focus much heat. The drop would have to be at a certain distance above the surface of the leaf to effectively focus sunlight, but then it would continue falling. Furthermore, they observed that the water droplet would have to stay in line with the sun to concentrate heat. But out in the world, the leaf moves in the air, and the sun moves across the sky, so the focus is constantly changing, and the effect is not concentrated in one spot long enough to accumulate significant heat. 
For all of these reasons, they concluded that, while it's theoretically possible for water droplets to focus sunlight, it would be very unlikely for that effect to be large enough to damage a leaf. There is a good reason to avoid spraying water in the hottest part of the day, but not because it might burn your plants. The reason not to spray water in the hot part of the day is because that will waste the water. Water sprayed through the air on a hot and sunny day will evaporate quickly, so not all of the water will get to the roots and help the plants. If the same amount of water is applied instead early in the morning or late in the afternoon, more water can soak into the soil and benefit the plants. Even better is to apply water directly to the roots using soaker hoses, drip lines, or water bags. Systems like these conserve water by keeping it out of the air where it evaporates quickly and getting it right into the soil. But if your plants are starting to wilt, whatever watering you can do right away is the best, even if that means using a sprinkler on a sunny day. Thank you for listening to this episode of Hits and Myths. That concludes another episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. We would like to thank Sandra Linnell and Devin Connolly from Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Green Counties for production support. And a special thank you to our listeners for joining us on this episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. You can find links to any of the topics mentioned in this episode at our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org. Comments and suggestions for future topics may be directed to us at columbiagreenmgb at cornell.edu or on the CCE Master Gardener Volunteers of Columbia and Green County's Facebook page. For more information about Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Green Counties, visit our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org or visit us in Hudson or in Acre. Cornell Cooperative Extension provides equal programming and employment opportunities 